And um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our next webinar. And just before I will start, I'm Ola, and I'm talking to you from the Newcastle upon Time in UK. And as always, we would like to thank our sponsorships, so the EIS, which allows us to offer all of these resources free of charge. And this is not only this webinar, we also include recorded lectures, learning tools, and even virtual field trips. So please feel free to browse our website. And now our today's speaker is Niels de Winter. He has a BSc and MSc from the University of Utrecht and a PhD from the Free University of Brussels. His work uh, is focused on improving methods for high resolution climate reconstruction from teeth and from the shells. And right now, Niels is working as a postdoc at the uh, Free University of Brussels and Utrecht University in a grant that is jointly funded by a Flemish Research Council and Marie Curie European Commission. And in this new postdoc, Niels is unraveling seasonality uh, during the past hothouse periods. And I guess that this will be the, the big part of his talk today. And the talk is titled, Toasty Coast in High CO2 Worlds, Marine Mollusk as Palau Weatherman. And before I will give the mic to Niels, just a very short information. The chat will be closed during the talk, but please feel free to to type your, your questions, the chat will be open, I think, at the pre-last slide, and, and then we can have a discussion. So thank you very much. What does the, the stage is yours, Niels. All right. Um, yes, you can hear me. So thank you very much, Ola, for, um, for the nice introduction. Thanks also, everyone, for joining. And of course, thanks for the invitation for me to, uh, to give a sets online talk. It's really cool. Um, so as Ola's already briefly mentioned, I'll um, in the coming half hour or so, try to keep it a, a bit short, um, explain a little bit about my work as uh, a paleoclimatologist who uses mollusks for reconstructions. Um, in short, I will kind of be taking you to on a trip to the beach today, uh, even though the weather outside, at least here, is, uh, is, is a bit rainy. Uh, it's going to be very sunny and warm, I promise you. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about how mollusks can, um, can be used for climate reconstruction, what they can tell us about the climate of the past, and uh, maybe we'll learn some surprising things from that. So let's get started. <clears throat> uh, I always like to start nowadays with this very nice uh, graph that's made by Jessica Pierney, uh, which I think is a very nice illustration of um, why we do what we do uh, as paleoclimatologists, and uh, the quote that that fits, of course, is the past is the key, key to the future. The, the reason why we're studying past climates is, of course, to learn something about our climate system. And then, of course, again, to prepare ourselves for the type of climates that we might be facing in the future under anthropogenic global warming. So here on this um, slide, you can see, and maybe I'll just quickly grab my pointer. Let me see. Yes, there it is. So you can see if we go further back in time, this will be very familiar to most of you. Um, we can actually reach or we can study periods, especially like, for example, the Eocene or the Miocene, uh, where climate was much hotter uh, because we had higher CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. We can even go further back in time to get to these really hot, hot house climates. And the interesting thing there is, of course, to um, see what climates are like when we have CO2 concentrations that are this high, and they, pro they potentially provide a very nice um, endpoint for CO2 emissions and what they can actually what they can cause in the future. So hopefully we won't reach temperatures like this, but anyway, there, there might be some nice analogs there. Um, the other slide that I'm quite fond of is, is this one, and there are several, um, uh, um, several versions of this. And this is one of the latest that I quite like from Anna von der Heide, a colleague of mine in Utrecht University. And what I I'm kind of have to walk you through this, but what you see here is a sort of spectral gram of climate change uh, on Earth. So on the x-axis here, you see periods or the periodicity, the time periods on which certain changes occur. And on the y-axis, you see sort of a measure for the variability in climate. And if we start on the left, and you see these very long-term things that, that are of high impact on climate, like uh, the formation of supercontinents, for example, which things like Milankovitch cycles, which are probably most of you are very familiar with. But what I want to highlight here is that on the very right hand side, like periods of a year, maybe periods of a day, we have very high variability in climate. And, and the, the thing that this slide shows very nicely and adequately, I think, 
is that periodicities at this time scale, and I would say summarize it as days to decades, are actually very, very important in climate. So things like seasonality, uh, diurnal changes, so day-night cycles, even tides, that kind of thing. And so maybe uh, multi-annual variability is actually a very high uh, variable component in climate. And we are very much interested in reconstructing and seeing what these type of um, variabilities are like in hot climates, because that's what we're heading. <clears throat> the other thing is that if we go back in time, and uh, this is a nice kind of temperature curve that is now being composed by the fantastic project, which is an excellent name, by the way, um, that is um, hosted by the Smithsonian Institution, where some very good colleagues are kind of producing this phenerozoic temperature curve. And if you go back to these hothouse periods, you see that at some of these periods, especially here, for example, in Triassic, but also in the mid Cretaceous, it gets very hot. So these are mean annual temperatures global. And if they exceed 30 degrees, and it kind of begs the question, if that's mean annual temperature globally, what are the summers in the tropics like? Well, it's, uh, how hot can we really get in these periods? And the, the funny thing is that um, many shallow marine organisms, such as, for example, the mollusks that I study, are um, very much thriving in these periods. They must be able to endure these very hot temperatures. And the, the interesting thing of, about studying these periods is also biological, right? So what, what, what makes these animals resist these type of periods? And the Cretaceous is a very good period for bivalves. We have Brutus bivalves building reefs in this time. <clears throat> so the question is, of course, uh, how are they able to withstand these very hot temperatures and of course what type of temperatures are we talking about right these are these are kind of annual averages what are the summers like so this is kind of what drives my research if you want to find out something about um, climate variability at this very short time scale um, as you know there are several type of records that we can use for reconstructing climate and i've already given it away a little bit so there's there's some some records like ocean sediments continental sediments that most of you might be very familiar with that are very good for these long-term reconstruction that I've shown over the past few slides. <clears throat> and there are some very high resolution records like ice cores, tree rings, that are very good for short-term variability. Generally, these short-term ones don't preserve very well. So if we want to have an, an idea about short-term variability very far back in our geological past, I would argue that the archive of skeletal carbonates and mostly like mollusks or bivalves, that's the archive that I study, is very useful for this because they do preserve this type of variability into the deep times so we can go to these periods where these interesting things happen and look at um, snapshots of climate. So um, very briefly, why mollusks? Uh, so there's two main reasons why I think mollusks are a really cool archive to study. The first is the very most important one maybe is the incremental growth. So these animals build their shells uh, and they grow a little bit like, like tree rings or like your fingernails, they build them layer by layer. And you can see some very nice images of this. Uh, here's, these are both fossil bivalves. So the one on the top here is Astarte Benedeni. It's an aragonitic bivalve from the Pliocene warm period that I've been, a student of mine, Nina, has been recently studying. And this is a very nice uh, microscope image where you see these increments uh, in the bivalve shell that's, that's been cut and polished. And these are actually tidal increments. So you can basically count like 12, 12 hour periods in these shells. So that's very exciting. <clears throat> this is one that's a little bit older and this is actually not, an, not a photograph image, but an XRF map. So it just shows you the distribution of trace elements. In this case, iron and manganese in this fossil oyster from the latest Cretaceous. So this one lived just before the meteorite hit basically and killed the dinosaurs. And you can see here also these increments, these are annual, so these are annual lamina in the shell that light up in this um, variability in the trace element composition. And the, the other nice thing is that these, these animals or these shells are able to preserve this, this type of information very far back in time. This is also an aerogenetic bivalve, but from the Triassic, so that's 223 million years old. This was brought to me last um, uh, fall when Najat al Futali, a very excellent student, came to us in Utrecht to, to work on, on other, and amongst other things, on the XRF, but also using some clumped isotope analysis. And we're currently analyzing also clumped isotopes in these very nicely preserved shells from this very hot Triassic period. And the point is that, that these type of uh, shells actually very are able to reconstruct or to, to recover, to preserve this information very far back in time, it makes them useful archives. So in my research, um, the postdoc that I'm now doing is called Unbias Unraveling Bivalve Shell Chemistry. 
I'm uh, interested in studying how far we can push this archive for mollusk shells. So what can we really get from these, from these shells, from these um, animals? And I do this, um, there are basically four pillars that, I'm, that I, um, that I um, do to, to try to, to make the, the reconstruction better that we can do from these, uh, these shells. Uh, the first is the culture experiments where we grow live bivalves, modern bivalves in, in cultured settings. Uh, the second is I develop statistical routines to see how we can get the most out of these, the, the data that we get out of these shells. I'm very fond of using the clump isotope method in Utrecht University at the moment where I am uh, to reconstruct temperatures. And I'm also doing a lot of high resolution analysis, mostly with trace elements, um, composition in shells. And I'll tell you a bit more about all four of those over the coming uh, slides. So the idea is that I'll walk you through the steps that we need to do, need to take to kind of make our reconstructions in these shells better. And I hope to structure it a little bit like, like this um, to, to guide you through more or less in the way I would, um, I would the kind of the path that I would take from the moment that I have the shell in my hand until the data set is there. So I hope that's, that makes it easy to follow. <clears throat> so the first thing that I um, think is very important, if you're looking at a bivalve shell, and this very nicely um, cross, nice cross section of one here, uh, again, this is the XRF map that you saw, saw before. We need to know if the shell is well preserved. So there are several indicators that we can do, that we, that we can measure to measure, kind of test the preservation of these, uh, these shells. And there's one method that I developed or that I helped develop in my, during my PhD, which is the XRF scanner, which is a little image here in the top. And this is a very nice, this nice map is an example of what you can do with this instrument. You can actually basically scan the surface of a shell and uh, scan it for composition of certain elements. And we have, we know that elements like manganese and iron get enriched in the shell material that is less well preserved. So that's the red parts of the shell here that are less well preserved than the blue parts are. And this way gives us a very nice uh, overview. These maps gives us a very nice overview of which parts of the shell we can sample to get good results for our climate reconstructions. So this XRF mapping is a nice screening tool. You can also uh, use it to kind of image very nice uh, shells uh, to see how the variability within the shell, if it's well preserved, is uh, behaving. So there's two nice examples here that I want to show. One is this one. Uh, um, from the Lutetian, so that's the Middle Eocene, about 45 million years old. It's Campanile gigantium. This is the longest gastropod that we know in the fossil record. This one is small, it's only 40 centimeters. They can grow up to a meter. And uh, I'll tell you a bit more about this, this guy later. Uh, but I just want to show you this nice strontium map here that you can kind of see the, uh, kind of visualize the, the growth structures in these, in these columella of these big gastropods. It gives you very nice maps. You can also use it to kind of quickly screen assemblages of shells like I did here from these Rudy's and oyster uh, from Oman. These are Campanian, so they're 75 million years old. And you see that we have cross sections for these two Rudy's and there's a, a big oyster here. And we can make these maps and then later select the right places to target for our uh, chemical analysis. So the conclusion here is that we can actually use this method as a nice preliminary screening tool to, to go on to further analysis. And an example of further analysis would be, for example, the clumped isotope method. Now, start with a little bit of chemistry before I go into the, the clumped isotopes. Uh, most of you might probably be familiar with stable isotope analysis, for example, oxygen isotopes, carbon isotope analysis. And what we do when we measure carbonates is we digest the carbonates with an acid, usually phosphoric acid, and we produce CO2. And for the normal uh, oxygen and carbon isotopes, we measure the ratio between mass 46 and 44 for the oxygen, mass 45 and 44 for the carbon. So we kind of measure the CO2 that has one have the isotope of one of these elements. And for the clumped isotope method, we're actually trying to measure this mass 47, which has both a rare uh, carbon isotope and a rare oxygen isotope in the CO2. And because there's two rare isotopes, this type of um, CO2 is actually much more rare. So it takes, it's more difficult to measure. But the nice thing about this is that um, the concentration of this mass here is, an, is a direct measure for temperature. And oxygenized, this has an advantage over the oxygen isotope method because the oxygen isotope method, we need to know the oxygen isotope composition of the fluid from which the carbonates grew to uh, be able to use it as a temperature proxy. We can, of course, always estimate this, but we know from experience that sometimes these estimates can be off and they can cause bias in our reconstructions. So this is the big advantage of the isotope method. Uh, it's more, it's diff more difficult to measure. We need more material to measure, but we can have an independent control on the temperature. 
So if we want to apply this on bivalves, we have a problem because <clears throat> these animals only grow so fast and we, um, we can only take so much sample from a certain part of the bivalve shell. And what I'm interested in is the thing that you see here. If you sample a bivalve shell through, through the shell right like this, so this is a nice example of an oyster from Sweden. I will tell you a little bit more about this guy later. You can get these very nice seasonal patterns in oxygen isotope composition. These are summers and winters. Um, but for the clumped isotope method, we need to combine several of these points together to get a good estimate of our temperature. So I've actually done some uh, over the COVID uh, lockdown period when we didn't have access to a lab. I did some, some statistical tricks or, or calculations and models to try to see what is the best way to combine methods, uh, to combine the data from the summers and winters to get these nice um, temperature reconstructions that we can get the compromise right between taking just the peak summers and the peak winters from these curves, so we get a good estimate of the summer and winter temperature without aver averaging too much, while still having enough um, data points to get a good temperature estimate. So there's uh, there's some there's a paper that we wrote about this, but uh, I won't go into too much detail. If you have questions later about it, I'm, I'm happy to show you a little bit more about this. It's a bit technical. So that that allows us. Let me. I'm going a little bit too fast here. So that's a lot, that allows us to use this clumped isotope method in a smart way to still, use, to still sample small samples and combine the small samples together to get a good temperature estimate for the summer and winter and get seasonal reconstructions. So before we can go out and merrily apply this on all sorts of fossil bivalves that are well preserved, we have two more issues that we need to overcome. And the first one is on my next slide here. We need to be able to internally date shells, right? So we have these very nice patterns, for example, here, this, like these nice seasonal patterns in the an oxygen isotope composition. And we know roughly yeah, from, from looking at this, what the summer and winters is, winters are, um, but it's kind of difficult to see um, beyond just pointing at the peaks and the valleys, uh, how do we actually date the springs and autumns, for example, uh, which, which uh, data point is from which month? Well, some bivalves actually give us a tool there. That's one of the nice thing about some, some mollusks actually, they grow, have these nice growth increments, like I showed before, these, these tidal increments, and we can just count them. We have also daily increments sometimes, and that solves our problem mostly, but not all bivalves do it, especially oysters are notorious for not having these very nice increments. And then we have to basically rely on the suction isotope uh, profile to kind of guess where our summers and winters is, are, and then interpolate in between. Well, my colleague Emily Judd um, developed a very nice model for this. We can actually kind of try to fit the temperature and a growth rate curve to produce these oxygen isotope, to reproduce these oxygen isotope uh, curves. And that will give us an idea about what the growth rate was over the seasons in these shells. And you can do this with, a, with a, you can write a nice model for this. Um, so I've applied our model actually on several studies. And then again, during the COVID lockdown, when I didn't have uh, lab access and I had some time on my hands, I um, tried to kind of um, make the model better by um, writing my own script in R, uh, which was recently published actually last week, uh, where I'm using kind of overlapping windows of this approach where, we, where I'm modeling the, the oxygen isotope curve. Like for example, this is a very idealized example here where you see the summer and winter rit rhythmics here. And what, what the model does basically, it, it kind of tries to fit the right growth rate and, and temperature seasonality to reproduce the oxygen isotope curve in a kind of um, stacked sliding window approach and you get these very nice distance versus time relationships for the shells just based on oxygen isotopes without needing these uh, growth increments. So that kind of solves uh, our problem of internally dating the shells and then we can more easily put these data points that we have on a monthly scale. So the second thing that we have to overcome before we can do these seasonality um, reconstructions is that we have to be certain that uh, actually what these shells are re recording is climate, right? So, so we have to test our methods or proxies. And a very nice way to do this is, and that's also a big advantage of models, uh, is that we can actually culture them in the lab. So I'm working together with my colleagues at the Dutch Institute for Sea Research in Niels in, in the north of the Netherlands. Um, let me see if this video works. Probably rid of the pointer there it is i hope you can see that so what we're doing is we're growing different types of bivalves with which have different types of shells different mineralogies calcite and oregonite in the lab and here you see these kind of tubs with water where we feed them and control the conditions so we can later sample their shells 
to test whether our proxies that we think record, for example, temperature, and yeah, the, the clumped isotope analysis method, for example, um, whether it actually does record what we think it records. And we can spike these animals with high concentrations of strontium, for example, to, to kind of find back the, the right times in the shells. And we did this for some uh, very nice species called Arctica Islandica, which is a very famous species for sclerochronologists, people studying bivalves like myself. Uh, also called the tree of the sea. This is a very uh, popular archive for climate re reconstruction and, and it's um, aerogenetic bivalves it grows an aerogenetic shell and we culture them at different temperatures and as you see these results are, are just in we're kind of still struggling with the data set I was just talking to Ola about this uh, but it looks like for, for now at least that um, that they actually do behave similar to the other uh, carbonates with respect to the clumped isotope method so they kind of fall on this on this um, colored line here, which is the, uh, at the moment, the state-of-the-art calibration for thumb isotope analysis. So that's reassuring. So we can use these shells for these type of reconstructions. So with that out of the way, we can actually go to some actual reconstructions. And I'll show you, I'll show you first the first study, clumped isotope seasonality study that I did, uh, kind of an offshoot of my PhD. We're going to uh, southern Sweden, Kristianstad Basin right here. And maybe I'll bring back my pointer so you can see. Right here, uh, back in the day, this was on the coast of the Boreal Chalk Sea. So back in the day, I'm talking about the Campania, so about 68 million years ago. And this site here is a very nice assemblage of, again, some rudis, but also lots of oysters that are very well preserved. And we applied the clumped isotope method. And again, this kind of method to, to, to tease out the summer and winter temperatures. And we discovered that in, in this uh, time in the Cretaceous, we have about 15 degrees in the, the coldest month. This is a mean month, monthly average. This is quite, kind of nice. Um, and 27 degrees for the warmest month uh, of the year back in the, back in the days. That's actually quite warm. So these are, this is a monthly average temperature. You can imagine that, that this is, a, this, and this is water temperature, right? So this is a, it was, it, it was getting very warm and a very nice uh, seasonality here. And another thing that is very interesting about this study, um, also in general of clumped isotopes, we get this independent control on temperatures and we can use it in combination with the oxygen isotope composition to kind of back calculate this oxygen isotope composition of the water. And what we see is that there's about a one per mil difference between summer and winter in the oxygen isotope composition of the water. And this is sort of problematic for people using oxygen isotope composition for temperature reconstruction because often it is assumed to be constant throughout the year and we show and we actually all our other data that we're gathering so far always shows that it's almost always not the case. So that's kind of um, something that we should be worried about, or at least that we should need, we need more reconstructions to see where you can actually assume that this stays constant. Then finally, we compared our results with a, a model from uh, Dan Lund and colleagues and Alex Farnsworth, uh, the HCM model from this for this time period. And what you see if you compare our results, which are the clear colored bars here, is different bivalves and the seasonality compared to other results is that they are a bit higher in, in terms of temperatures and they fit, they fit slightly better with the model. And then most of these data points, and these are from bulk mollusks, some, some fish teeth and some chalk uh, data. And we, um, one of our take home messages from this paper, which is uh, published last year, is that there might be some cold bias in some of these, um, these um, other uh, reconstructions due to the seasonality or maybe also due to preservation because some of the chalk there's already, already been written about that they it kind of sinks to the bottom and partly re-precipitates re at bo bottom water temperatures which is not the same as the surface temperature so there might be some this is a good example of um, what these seasonality studies can actually show whether there is a seasonal bias or not in these other proxies so at the moment we're taking it a bit closer to home we have some nice um, specimens from the Pliocene warm period, which is not so long ago, just, just 3 million years. Uh, and this is a very interesting period uh, because the Pliocene warm period had about the same CO2 concentration, about 400, 430 ish ppm as we have at the moment. Uh, so this is a good uh, potential analog for if our CO2 concentration stays the way it is and we kind of let our climate equilibrate, we end up at the Pliocene kind of situation where it was about three degrees warmer. And we have some excellent aerobatic shells from the harbor of Antwerp, actually, where they, when they dig a new harbor uh, part, uh, you can just kind of co come collect the shells from these uh, sand deposits. And we have some very nice, excellent students working on this. And there's also the very nice model framework, the PlyoMIP, where they uh, co combine different models in this, uh, in this framework. So we have a good um, basis for data model comparison when the data is in. So I want to show you, this is an ongoing project, but I want to show you some initial results. 
So here's some very brief, um, um, so far, uh, delta eight no curves from three different species that we got from this same period. Um, so we have this, um, we're basically measuring plant isotopes and, and uh, oxygen isotopes at the same time. We get these very nice seasonal patterns. So as you see from especially the bottom ones here, there's still some work to be done. We have now a new student called Bram uh, who is uh, doing some excellent work and does a very high resolution sampling of the Glacimeris and Arctica sp uh, specimens. And I had a very good student in the spring of last year, uh, Nina, who worked on Astrata Benedini, actually did already a very nice data set. And I want to highlight some of this clump and also of these EBSD results. So she did some a very nice method that I actually wasn't familiar with myself before we did this project, which is called electron backscatter diffraction. It's a method where we could get, look at polished sections through these uh, small shells and, and actually pinpoint the uh, orientation of the minerals in the shells. You can see that the different shell layers actually have different mineral orientations. So I really like these colored maps. The colors kind of show you sort of an indication of how the minerals are oriented in these shells. And it is a very nice tool, uh, although a bit expensive, <laughs> for screening shells and kind of characterizing new species. Since I started being any species was not, has not been studied before. And we also got some very nice clump results about, uh, again, as we expect, about two to three degrees warmer. And the um, warming of the Pliocene was mostly driven, as far as our data shows, by warmer uh, summer, more or less the same as they are, they were, they are nowadays. The summers are like five degrees warmer. So that's quite interesting. And, but again, this is work in progress. So that was the Pliocene. And in the future, we're actually looking to expand this work further towards other periods of interesting uh, climates, like the Miocene and the Eocene hothouse. We actually just talked about earlier this, this morning uh, with a new PhD student, Barbara, to, uh, we're probably gonna soon sample some of these Eocene um, uh, material and also start to do clump isotopes on that, compared with the models, I hope to have some more to show you later. Uh, so that's, that was it mostly for the seasonality work. Um, but of course, the question arises, can we, can we do actually more? We know that these bivalve shells do have <coughs> uh, lamina and growth structures that are far beyond annual uh, growth lines. At least some of them do. And um, we're, the interesting thing is that we can try to, uh, we, we actually do have methods that, are, uh, that allow us to achieve high enough resolution to capture variability at very short um, spatial scales in these shells. And one very nice method is uh, laser ablation ISPMS, where you can basically shoot a laser at a polished section of a bivalve shell and actually measure, measure trace element content on a scale of tens of micrometers. And this allows us to kind of trace very small variability in the shell. And this type of work started, uh, got my interest during sort of in the end of my PhD where I um, where I looked more closely at this one rudis that you've seen before, actually, where I showed some XRF maps. It's from this Omani section where we had this assemblage of different bivalve shells from the companion, about 75 million years old. And what you see, if you look at this closely, that is that these rudis have these very fine lamina here. And this is a very nice uh, micrograph showing this. And they're bundled in these kind of light and dark bundles. And if you zoom in even more, you'll see that there are individual lamina there. <clears throat> and we were wondering if you could actually capture any chemical changes over this very short time scale, this very thin lamina. So we went on to do this very high resolution ISPMS study. And what we found is that these, uh, that these uh, lamina actually do have characteristic uh, chemical variability, which is if you count the number of lamina within the, the year, because we also have the annual lamina, uh, we find that there is about 372 of them uh, in the shell, uh, which corresponds very nicely with the uh, number of days that we had back in the Cretaceous, at uh, least the late Cretaceous. Uh, and as you see here, and we have measured magnesium, strontium, calcium, and lithium in these shells. And if you look at these ratios between, for example, magnesium, lithium, strontium, calcium, you see that the variability that we ex extracted from these records, we used uh, some spectral analysis techniques and layer counting for this, <coughs> this variability on this daily scale, so these are daily cycles, are actually, is actually higher than annual variability. So these animals have a huge uh, range of chemical variability on the daily scale. This is very exciting. Uh, what is also exciting is that we can kind of count the number of days and then uh, kind of back calculate how many hours were in the day, which is about half an hour less than nowadays. And um, the media really liked this. So they picked up this aspect of the study a lot. And they say like, ah, the Cretaceous had more days and the days were shorter. So that was something that we got a lot of media attention for. Although it was a little bit um, unfairly maybe, because I think it's not the most interesting thing aspect about this, uh, this study. 
what is more interesting to me, at least, is that um, we could actually show that this type of variability is recorded in a shell of a rudist, which is uh, 75 million years old. That then in itself is already interesting. But it also tells you a lot about the, potentially about the biology of these animals. Um, we actually uh, had some hypotheses in the, in the paper that we stated that these day-night cycles were very important to, the, to these animals, that, that it must mean that they were photosymbiotic. This is actually an ongoing discussion in paleobiology. These rudist uh, bivalves, so these, these are these rebuilding bivalves from the Cretaceous that I mentioned earlier. Uh, some people have been suggesting that these have had photosymbionts and they grew a little bit like corals. They look also a little bit like corals. I'm not sure if this is conclusive evidence for this, but it's, um, there's a good chance that this is actually uh, what's driving these chemical variability. Because, of course, if they have photosymbionts, they're very uh, sensitive to this day-night cycle. But the other thing that's very interesting, of course, is that um, if we are able to capture um, variability in these shells on the scale of days, uh, what else can we, can we learn from these animals? Can we actually uh, interpret some of these signals as paleoenvironmental signals? And that kind of brings us into the, the realm of paleo weather, uh, if I uh, may call it that. And we're not yet sure, of course. Um, so if we are able to capture things on the scale of hours or days, maybe we can uh, say something about what the weather was like in the Cretaceous. And that is, of course, uh, for paleoclimatologists, maybe even more interesting. And there is some evidence from modern shells, and this is all, <clears throat> these are all studies that, are, uh, that have titles that are probably too small for you to read, but these are all studies on uh, giant clams uh, that got, got me kind of interested in this, um, this topic, uh, where they here measure, for example, strontium calcium ratio in very high resolution uh, over these lamina in giant clams, which have symbionts as well. Um, and nowadays, these are from the South China Sea. Uh, this is an excellent study uh, showing these very nice uh, patterns also. And uh, this is by Wolfgang Müller and his colleague Viola Walter, where they uh, also took a giant clam and again did laser based on ICPMS. And they also see these daily, daily rhythms. And a very, um, like a, a more recent study in Yanatal in 2020 actually showed that some of these spikes in, in iron in these uh, shells here correspond to typhoons that, that are uh, coming over these animals. Uh, during their growth in the South China Sea. So there is actual evidence that they do record extreme weather. So that is very exciting. And, and then the question becomes, of course, how much of this trace element variability in the shells is related to things like photosymbiosis and how much of it is potentially related to uh, weather patterns? And can we actually reconstruct weather patterns from those? So to answer this question, we are currently uh, doing a little study again on the modern bivalves. Uh, so we're comparing pectinids from breast uh, area, which I kindly got from uh, Lucas Froelich from the University of Mainz, who was also working on these very nice uh, specimens. And uh, I have uh, a range of different species of tridagnids, so again, these giant clams uh, that Dan Killam provided me with from the, uh, um, from the Red Sea here in Eilat, close in the southern coast of Israel. <clears throat> and the nice thing about these here is that um, the tridagnids have photosymbionts nowadays, and pectinids don't. So we could actually compare the two to see what the effect of photosymbiosis is on these high resolution trace element patterns. And we're doing that uh, just now. And the other interesting thing is that there we have one specimen here called M1 that actually grew under a sunshade. So it wasn't exposed to the sunlight. So we could actually directly test by comparing this one with the others, directly test whether the sunlight is directly influencing them or whether there is other things going on like circadian rhythm. So that's, there's lots of uh, interesting things that we could get from this data set. And it is also a work in progress, but I'll show you some preliminary results. What we do find in general, and this is for strontium calcium. Again, I extracted the, the variability in strontium calcium in these shells measured at a very high amplitude. So these are, uh, this is the duration of the cycle. And here you see the amplitude of the cycle. So what you see, if you take the tridagnids in red, they are in, indeed more and more variable in the daily um, period, while the pectinids, which are blue, which are not symbiotic, have more of a tidal rhythm in their um, uh, composition of their shell. So that actually argues for the photosymbiosis effect. It seems like photosymbiosis does have some effect on these rhythms in the, in the chemical composition of the shell. Um, but also, if we uh, look at the total variance in these high resolution records, this, these type of uh, tidal and daily periods only explain about 5% of the variance. So the rest of it is either more chaotic or maybe it is something environmental that we could get out of this. So there, there's some work to be done there. So there's some potential here that we have a lot of, um, I guess, paleo weather signal in these shells. 
So of course, if we could bridge the gap from climate to weather, that has very exciting um, um, <coughs> implications because we, in extreme weather is kind of uh, a hot topic at the moment. It's one of the most dangerous things that we can experience from climate change. And if we could actually re reconstruct weather patterns or extreme weather in past hothouse climates, that might teach us something about what type of extreme weather might be um, we might face in the future. So that is very exciting. And arguably, if we're going further with this in the fossil record, the most exciting archive that we could exploit to, uh, to see if this can actually be done is this giant sea snail that I've told you about before. And I'll tell you in the end of my presentation a little bit about the work that we've been doing on this guy, also on a sub-seasonal scale. So again, these are Campanile gigantium from the mid Eocene, about 45 million years old. And here we see, these are from the Paris Basin, the Champagne region, excellent place to do field work. Uh, and here you see my colleague Johan Velikoop, who proudly uh, presents this very big shell that we just got out of the of the koi here. And we had a very good um, uh, amount of these shells, some smaller ones. These, like I showed you before, this is, this is 40 centimeters. The one that we're that we'll st really studying now is bigger. And we published a paper earlier uh, in 2020. Uh, that's already two years ago, actually. So the, um, where we actually compared oxygen isotope profiles, so this is not clumped isotope work, but just oxygen isotope work uh, from these Eocene shells, these E1, 2, and 3, with the same profiles that we have from the closest relative from Australia. This is Campanile symbolicum that still lives today, where we know in which temperature it grew. So we can actually show that this, these animals do record temperature uh, variability in their shell. And in the Eocene, they also uh, we have these very nice seasonal patterns. So these are very promising archives for um, for seasonality reconstruction. And also it got quite hot in the EU scene. That's also nice, um, which is what we expect, I guess. So again, we use this um, modeling method to put these records on the time domain. <clears throat> and what we discovered is that these very large shells, so these, these 40 centimeters of shell, and these animals, um, we kind of thought that we would have a very nice long climate record, but actually these animals grow to 40 centimeters in about three or four years. So these are probably the fastest growing mollusk in the fossil record, at least as far as we know. If you plot their growth rate here together with some other fast growers, like uh, like some rudists and some of these pectinids, we actually need to expand the scale here to, to fit them on. If you kind of count them as growing through the helix, they grow amazingly fast. So they're like a very good archive for high resolution uh, work. <clears throat> And recently, we got a very excellent student, Nick from Horebeek from Leuven University, uh, Johannes in Leuven, and we we're doing this project together, who took one of these uh, larger shells and, and sampled it, uh, I would always say to death, but it was already dead, but it sampled a very high resolution oxygen isotope composition uh, profile through the shell. And what you see here, these, these swings here are years. So we have these uh, about 50 to 100 data points. This is not even the whole data set per year, so we can actually get really, really uh, uh, high resolution um, <clears throat> composition of the shells. And what you see in the summer, so which is the, what we interpret to be the summers, the lowest uh, delta eight, you know, lowest oxygen composition, so highest temperature, you would think. <clears throat> Excuse me, part of this year, you see that the variability actually increases a lot. So we were thinking maybe we have captured here some extreme weather events, some more variable weather, at least in the summer. So what we did then is went to Utrecht with these, um, these samples and sampled them for clumps. So we specifically targeted these four seasons as, as we interpret them from the oxygen isotope profile. So the winters are the dark blue. And then we have some autumns and springs here and we have the summers. And what we see actually is that the autumns and springs are very hot. So they're over 30 degrees and they're actually hotter than what we think are the summers. So it seems like there's some sort of um, fresh water input that offsets or um, oxygen isotope composition in these shells. And maybe there is some evidence here for um, these switches, swings in, in these oxygen isotope composition, which are almost up per mil sometimes. We are targeting those for clumped isotope analysis as well now to see if we can actually disentangle the uh, effect of these um, freshwater input, input or maybe weather input from the temperature effect on these um, weather scale events in the summers that, that these animals went through. So in short, these, these animals were very living in a very hot climate, but they, they probably also faced some very stormy weather, um, hence the umbrella. I want to uh, close the, the presentation because I'm always running out of time a little bit <clears throat> uh, with uh, a little bit of a sneak preview about what we're, another project that uh, my, our new PhD student, Barbara Goudsmit is now starting with 
where we're actually testing this heat wave uh, hypothesis or whether these heat waves are, are whether events are recorded in the shell in our culture stations. We have these these cockles, these very nice small bivalves that go to argonitic shells and also have these very nice tidal lamina in their shells. And we're growing them under controlled condition and exposing them to heat waves and other um, weather events or maybe artificial weather events, I guess, or maybe we have some real ones. And uh, Barbara will be combining this these um, uh, reconstructions that we get from these shells to test um, whether we can actually record these type of events in the shells and combine also um, fossil data uh, with models that she's already been working on uh, to see whether we can reconstruct, really reconstruct extreme weather in hot house climates like the EUC. So stay tuned for more. Uh, with that, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope we have time for questions and uh, happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you, Niels, very much. Don't worry at all, it was perfect timing. And Great. thank you very much for this amazingly detailed talk. And it was detailed in, in every meaning of the word. Um, this is just really amazing. What can you do at which resolution you can reconstruct the past if you get an adequate archive? But it's, I realize it's not only the archive itself. You also need to have the, the means, the patience, the, the ideas, the hypothesis. So yeah, very impressive. Um, all right, so the, the chat is open for questions. I don't see any question yet. And um, I had one, I had actually some, but um, it's a typical thing. Not a question, more of a comment. <laughs> But I very much enjoyed the example that you have showed with the two bivalves. One was growing in the sunshine and one was growing in the shade. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that this is, um, um, I think that right now the, the, the scientists are more and more opening towards the different types of heterogeneities in the system. So that even that, that two archives, which are very close to each other, do not necessarily need to record the same, the same signal or record it in the same way. And I think that, that looking at the bivalves and one growing in the shade and one in the sunshine is like as, yeah, as, as close to the unexpected heterogeneity or maybe not unexpected, but the one that, that is not really accounted for as you can, as you can get. So I'm looking forward to, to see the results. Yeah, the, the main idea behind this is of course that even if we have daily cycles in the chemistry of the shells, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's just you know, affected by the by the sunlight, it might be as these animals also have circadian rhythms, and we kind of want to decouple the whatever the environmental impact from the biological impact in these animals. That's kind of it's kind of harder than you than you would think. <laughs> and the data set is not conclusive, I guess, but it's like a, it's a step in the right direction. And really, really even figuring out uh, in how much these animals are building shells and in which which pace at at these time scales is really tricky. But we're, we're trying. All right. We have a first question um, from Christiana Bassett, and she's tuning in from Washington. Yes, Christiana, thank you very much. And to all people asking questions, please don't forget to write where you're watching us from. So here comes the question and the praise, of course. Hi, Niels. Great talk. I'm wondering if you're giving any thought to as as to whether or not submarine groundwater discharge might be driving some of the summer Delatino variability. I guess that's the, that's the question towards the last. Um, yeah, I think so. I'll put, last. Put, yes. Put mm -hmm. the slide back. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so that, that's a great question. So then uh, obviously the, the, the thing that we can do with clumped isotopes is kind of disentangle whether, whether this is a temperature signal or whether this is a, an oxygen isotope signal in the water. What we cannot do is whether this signal comes from, I guess, precipitation or groundwater discharge. This is not something that, that our method of clumped isotopes will tell us, uh, but we are planning to team up for this record with, um, with our colleagues in the modeling departments to see if it is actually likely uh, this far, this high up in the um, in latitudes, basically in the Paris basin to get storm tracks there, because that might actually be not, not feasible to produce at all. And in that case, if it's not, then maybe this groundwater discharge hypothesis might be a nice alternative. So that's, uh, I, I didn't 
give that much thought yet, but that's, I would ask you to look into that. That's great. And if I could, oh, wait. All right, yeah, exactly. I'm grappling with the same issue over in the Pacific. I'd love to chat with you about this. So I'm, yeah, I'm, pretty, sure. yeah, I'm pretty sure that you will have a lot of chances later on. Um, oh, yes, there's another question. Um, thank you very much, Niels, for this talk. Very interesting. For the Paleozoic, can this type of study be done with bypass or other fauna, or is it not feasible by resolution? And can some analysis be done if the shells has been replaced by silica? And the question is coming from Yuan from Bogota. So two questions for the price of one. That's that's great. So um, my answer to the first one would be um, we do have these um, these shells from the Triassic, which is a very nice hot period also. And if as long as these these bivalves are well preserved, it would be possible to. Um, to, to get the same resolution. I mean, the, it really depends. The resolution really depends on how fast these animals grow. That's why these, these snails are so interesting, right? Because they grow so fast. Um, not all of them do, but if you would have uh, mollusks, well-preserved ones from the Paleozoic um, that have very fast growth, I won't, don't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to reach this resolution. Um, the other thing about the silica replacement for our uh, carbonate-based chemi geochemical methods, this might be a problem, right? Because we're uh, if, if you're replacing your shell partly or wholly by silica, silica, it might overprint your, um, I mean, it will definitely overprint your, your isotope signal and probably also the trace elements. That kind of depends on the case. Uh, we do have some examples of this from the Omani bivalves where the, some of the edges are actually silicified, but the, the, the internal of the shell is well preserved. So it's not, not always lost if there's some silica uh, replacement, I guess. But it really depends on the specimen, and, and we have to do first screening for this type of uh, type of diagenesis. I think that's a good question. Next question is coming from Stephen from Derby. Thanks for a fabulous presentation. Does the sediment that these critters <laughs> critters are living um, in affect any of the signatures? Um, I am thinking here of mixed siliciclastic carbonate sediments. And there is an example to it. Do the sediments pollute any signatures? <clears throat> well, I would think if, if, they, uh, if the preservation is good enough and you can screen for this, uh, they should not. Um, if, if, of course, if there is a, a mixed in of the, if, if the sediment um, signature gets mixed in the shell, that usually means that it's, that there is some uh, recrystallization, right? Or maybe locally in the shell. And we can actually use some of the screening methods for this. And also we have to do like things like scanning electron microscopy and, and these type of methods to see if this actually occurs. Um, I don't think that, that leaching of trace elements, for example, into the shell is a big risk. Um, but I mean, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure, but it's, uh, I think it's, uh, I haven't yet seen it convincingly to happen without any of the uh, diagenesis flags being, being read, basically. So, yeah. All right, next question is coming from Ross. Thank you, Neil, so interesting. Why do iron and magnesium in the shell lamina indicate alteration diagenetic effects? And Ross <clears throat> is watching us from Canada. So, so this is a, a great follow-up question almost from the, the previous one. Because what happens in, if you bury um, these sediments in general, right? not always, but is that you uh, use a polyoxygen at some point and your, uh, your environment gets reduced. And then all these iron and manganese oxides, that they get remobilized as, as uh, dissolved iron and manganese in the pore fluid. And then if your shell recrystallizes, it might still recrystallize as carbonate, but it will take up much of this manganese and iron concentration in the carbonate that would otherwise, I mean, in, at surface conditions, not be incorporated in the shell. So that's why this is such a very nice flag for uh, for diagenesis. If you have this recrystallization and in under these circumstances, this iron and manganese gets built in the shell and it's at much higher concentration, like order of magnitudes higher than natural variability. All right, thank you. Next question is from Mark watching us in Bristol, UK. Hi, great talk. Have you tried these techniques with other groups of carbonate biomineralizing animals, such as echinoderms? I know, I know there are people, 
doing this. Um, well, one can only do so many, so many things. <laughs> so I've kind of specialized in the mollusks, uh, which is already a very diverse group. But uh, yes, there, there are definitely uh, possibilities to do uh, lots of other. I mean, these type of high resolution techniques are interested in all sorts of carbonates, not even only biogenic ones. I think speedotems and people are doing this type of work on, on different carbonate archives, and they're all uh, reaching similar or exciting results in their own respect, I think. So, so yeah, definitely. All right. Oh, and here's another question coming. It's a relatively long one. So, great talk, Niels. I'm wondering how certain you can be in accurately detecting Delo 18 at the coldest parts of the year, especially in colder climate high latitudes, where some species might be precipitating less material. This is a worry for crocodile teeth, uh, sorry, crocodilian teeth. Um, there seems to be a lot of jumping around at the coldest winters from Van, oh yeah, van Hörebrugs in preparation work. Tuning from Copenhagen, Denmark. And this was Nick asking the question. I'm sorry for all the misspelling that happened. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, that, that's also a very good question. So you can actually see this on the slide that I have up right now that um, in the colder seasons uh, here, you see that these, what you would expect normally to be sort of a sinusoidal movement, right? It gets kind of spiky. And that's just because these animals don't grow as fast generally in cold seasons. At least most of them do. We have seen evidence of opposites as well. Some, some, sometimes, sometimes they don't grow fast in the, in the warm season. but of course, yeah, of course, if the, if the growth rate is so season will be variable and uh, then it becomes more and more difficult to get kind of the peak winter condition here or lower winter temperatures because you have less material here. So that means that you will be able, you will be averaging more of this material that's farther away from the winter and indeed it will make your estimate less um, accurate. There is uh, some ways to to, to counter this, of course, is if you have enough material, then you could just sample more here to kind of compensate for what you're losing. And uh, in these models, both mine and, and the one from Emily Judd, that's actually one of the reasons why we include this growth rate sinusoid to kind of try to pull apart these condensed parts of the records um, by estimating what the difference is in growth rate between the seasons. And this way we can kind of compensate for our bias in, in the resolution of our records. And this is very essential, I think, if you would. So this, this record here is in growth direction. So this is in distance domain. But if you would put this in time domain, you kind of stretch out this part. So you, you can see that you're, um, you're compensating for this, uh, for this problem. So, but yeah, we should be, we should be careful with this. Um, so answer to it from Nick is cool. It sounds like um tools like shellcron might be helpful in combating this thank you i hope so all right yeah waiting for another question i have to admit that this this record here is also very impressive and similarly i was wondering <laughs> if there is any yeah maybe not a kind of bias but how much different it would look in case if you if you plot it on the time and not in, in the depth or as a distance. Um, yeah, I, sh I should have included, um, I don't think in the backup slides I have the, the time because we were still busy with the age model. And um, mm -hmm. so Nick did it first with the, uh, with the model from Emily Judd because the paper was about the shellcon wasn't out yet. So we're, we're actually having a meeting next week to, to see if we can apply the shellcon to see and to, to check which of the two are giving us more reasonable results. But yeah, if you would, um, I, mean, I mean, I cannot say kind of a uh, guess, I guess, but, but what will happen is because you, if you would fit like a, a combined growth rate temperature sinusoid to a curve like this, it will basically stretch out this part mm -hmm. more than, and squeeze this part more and it will, it will kind of form it more into a sinusoidal uh, function, which is in some way also an assumption. I mean, in the end, if you would have like growth increments, it would be even better because you could really, uh, detect uh, interannual variability in growth rate. Uh, but in, in absence of that kind of type of um, information, this is the best we can do. And it, it kind of helps us at least eliminate some of the bias, except of course, when the shell really stops growing, which also happens sometimes. So that's, that's of course something we cannot um, invent data, right? So if, we don't, if the if shell doesn't, doesn't um, yeah produced carbonate, then that's where it stops, I guess. But at least then in, in the case, we can kind of uh, estimate if this happened or not. 
and we can actually estimate how much of it we lost, we lost, so that can also elim eliminate some of the bias. So this would be a follow-up question for this. In case of these particular mollusks, can you actually see in the shell or can you notice in the shell just by looking at the shell that it stopped growing or not necessarily? Yeah. Okay. Generally, they, generally, yes. Often you get these winter lines when, and there's always the question if it really stops or if it grows very slowly, but it kind of gets more condensed and you get these, sometimes you get these very sharp um, yeah. growth stops, uh, growth checks there. They're very um, easy to recognize in most shells. So yeah, yeah. you would see that. I'm, I'm asking because this is more, I wouldn't say my hobby, but this is what I was lately doing, checking the, the land snails that are growing in our mid latitudes and there are seasons where they are not growing and comparing them with the ones that are growing from, from the tropical regions. And it's, it's actually kind of really interesting how clearly you can see the, the line when the shell stopped growing. Yeah, so I, I just put up this slide here, and this is the cockle. Cockles are one, one of the easiest ones to see this in. And you yeah. can actually see the, the black line here. This is a growth stop, so this is a winter. Okay. And there's, I think there's another one here, I'm not entirely sure. I, I didn't actually hold this shell myself, but it's like, um, you can see it very clearly. And these, and these also have a very nice tidal laminar. This is a really great, great bio to study here. Yeah. It also kind of shows that, that the growth is not necessarily linear, that the growth probably is not linear. I also mean not only during the seasons, but during the lifetime of the animal, that when Definitely. they're smaller, they grow faster and they, they kind of slow down. Yeah, so th this is one of the reasons why these culture experiments are so important, because we can kind of monitor that growth even within a, within a season by spiking them with these strontium spikes. I kind of went over this really quickly, but we, we're enriching the water with the strontium so we can kind of really uh, pinpoint which, which part of the shell grew in which section of the, of the year. And what we also see is that often people think this is uh, purely temperature, that they have like some sort of temperature threshold on the bottom. But what seems to be the case, and my, my colleague Rob Pitbat, whom I'm doing this, uh, these culture experiments, knows much more about this than me, but it actually seems to be the case that it's also very strongly tied to the food availability. So that's in the spring, they grow much faster than in the autumn when it's the same temperature. Mm -hmm. So there, there's kind of different biological factors that determine this. So it's, it's kind of complicated, but interesting. Yeah, but it, it also shows that just flat rating the records that we are having as only seeing the, the temperature is, um, is not necessarily always correct. It's complicated, yeah. Ah, no, 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 not complicated. It's, it's um, challenging and exciting. Yeah, definitely. I would agree. <laughs> All right. So, um, Nias, since like, I think five minutes, we are just chatting the two of us. I, dear audience, do you have any more questions for Niels? I'm pretty sure if you don't have them now, or if you're, you're shy to ask the question, um, you might get in contact with Niels just, well, well, you will, you will find his email. Yeah, and I forgot to put it on the slide. Sorry about it. I can put it in the chat also if that's, if that's helpful. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, um, that it will work, yes. Um, so one last thing, Niels, thank you very much for this really amazing talk. I was very much impressed. And um, for the audience, so please keep in mind we are meeting next week, uh, same time, same place. And next week, Dan Parson will be talking about flooding and its sedimentological footprint. So thank you very much. Niels, thank you again for the great talk. And audience, thank you for joining us in the discussion. And I guess, yes, enjoy your evening and see you next week. Bye-bye.